Let's just get started. Um, what kind of prayer do we have? I know that uh, Fernando just informed me that he lost his grandfather on Monday morning, passed away. And he just was informed that one of his players tested positive for COVID. And evidently, they're gonna still play. <laughs> I definitely will put them on the list on the way they're starting to handle these things. That's what he's asking for. Any other prayer requests? Yes, sir. Brother worked there also? Yeah. Yeah. I remember Alma. Anyone else? Anybody else that you know of needs prayer? times brothers and sisters it seems like there is a lot of individuals that we know are suffering and going through much God is good he really is good and he'll see us through these difficult times um, let's bow our hearts in prayer and we'll begin with prayer um, Brother Sam Scott isn't here to ask the question, so we're going to jump right into, into Zephaniah chapter 3. He locked us down pretty much all last week. But uh, 
<laughs> if we have time to, after we go through the lesson, if we if we have time, we'll come back, circle back, and uh, and uh, see if we can't answer some of these questions. I, w I love to thank God for the fact that coming in here, walking back there, and seeing all that food is phenomenal. It is a blessing. And like you said, there's about 37 names on that list so far. What a blessing it is that the Lord is providing for all those families that have one less thing to worry about this holiday uh, and, and, and a lot to be thankful for. So I pray that as we give these uh, uh, individuals their their uh, Thanksgiving baskets, I pray that the Lord touches their hearts and they can really see where this food is really coming from. It isn't coming from us. It isn't coming from the church. It isn't coming from those donations as much as it's being sent by our Lord for he is truly faithful. So let's bow our hearts in prayer as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Almighty God, that we have the opportunity in the middle of this week that you have given us, that we're able to come together and praise and worship you on a Wednesday night. What a magnificent time, Almighty God, and time when all of the country is gearing up for Thanksgiving, to have little understanding that for you, Almighty God, we have Thanksgiving every second of the day. We come in Thanksgiving, and now, more than ever, thank you, Lord, for your sovereign hand upon us. We thank you, Almighty God, for moving us from death into life through Christ, our Lord and Savior. We thank you, Lord, for calling us out of darkness, for giving, of, uh, for giving us of our sin through your grace and your mercies that never end. You hold us, you keep us, you guide and direct us. You love us, almighty God, even when we don't show love back. You're always there. You wait for us to turn to you as we turn from our sin. You wait, Almighty God, for us to recognize you as we are doing other things. You wait patiently for us, Father. Tonight, we are here before you saying thank you, Lord, for everything that you have going on in our lives. The good, difficult, and the bad. The, the good is easy to praise and worship you for. The difficult Almighty God keeps us on our knees searching for you. The bad allows us to trust that you were there in the most difficult of times. Difficult of times for family members as the Fernandez family is making arrangements for their grandfather. The pain and the suffering that is Father is going through, that Fernando's father is going through, Almighty God, ease those painful, broken hearts. Help them get through, Almighty God. Pray for family members that are struggling, trying to make ends meet in this place having a difficult go of it, trying to pay bills. Father, we pray that you bring them through their difficult times. Pray for our family members and our church friends, our neighbors, Lord. For it pleases you when we come to you with all things, especially the cares those that we love, those that we care about. We come to you knowing that you ultimately, Almighty God, can fix everything. You can ease the pain of those that are suffering. Those that have just gotten bad news, being diagnosed not only with COVID, which is a very frightful virus, Lord, yet and still in, in today's landscape. 
but being diagnosed with cancer, Almighty God. Lord, we know that you are able to do anything but fail. We pray for those family members like Suki's brother that is struggling with cancer, like Danny's neighbors and friends. Pray for individuals close to this church, Heavenly Father. Ron's employees that have been diagnosed with cancer. Lord, it is a difficult time for many. Nothing is too difficult for you. We know and understand that your will shall be done. And we come to you, almighty God, not knowing the outcome but knowing you care. We pray, Lord, that your hands are upon these individuals that were mentioned. We pray, Lord, that those individuals suffering from this virus and COVID, children in school and the teachers and all the individuals dealing with this, pray that you strengthen them Pray that you strengthen their families because there's fear, anxiety, and stress that always seems to come with this. Lord, we pray that during this week that we find ourselves in close fellowship one with another through giving out these baskets and through church service that the fellowship is built stronger and stronger week by week. You can use good fellowship, Master. This is what you have called us to as unity. Family relying on one another. Building up one another. Pray, Lord, that as we are going through this fellowship, that you build us up in your word. For there is no fellowship without Christian growth. We need you to meet us where we are. We need you to touch our hearts and guide us to where you desire for us to be. We need you, Lord, to lead us. Bringing us into a place where is acceptable to you. Bringing us from infancy into a mature Christian walk, which we can lead others that we have enough faith to lead others along with us to come alongside of us to take on the responsibility of discipleship mentorship we pray lord for these things because this is what you have asked us to do it's difficult at times but it's not impossible causes us to have a desire for more commitment to you, Lord. As we draw nearer to you, Master, we pray that you continue to strengthen us where we are. That we don't keep the good news to ourselves. That we share the love you have given us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We go into your word we go into Zephaniah. We go into a very critical part of our Christianity. We pray, Lord, that we can see what you have ordained from the ancient days. We pray, Lord, we learn the lessons that those who suffered went through. And that it strengthens us, Lord. That we are better than when we came in. Stronger than when we came in. Wiser than when we came in tonight. We pray for your guidance. We pray for the Spirit to guide and lead us. In Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Is
Zephaniah. We're going to begin in chapter 3, and we're going to take a look at verse number 8. Just talked about the indignation of the children of Israel. How they never caught on. They just purposely denied the discipline of Christ, the discipline of God. But here's the good news. There's always good news with bad news when it comes to God. And it's bad news and great news. It's bad news and magnificent news. It's bad news and marvelous news. It's bad news and Christ. It's bad news and redemption. He begins to talk about redemption for a remnant of people that have been persecuted and will be persecuted in the future. God is going to allow a remnant to survive the takeover of Babylon. They're going to allow a remnant to survive the persecutions, the slavery, and all that it entails. And God is going to bring them through. And it's a microcosm of the big picture. We see here what God is doing with Israel, and we're going to see in Revelation that it's going to happen again in end time. But we're going to focus here on verse number 8, 9, and 10. God is speaking through Zephaniah. And after all the destruction, after all the prophecy of being broken and enslaved and taken out of Jerusalem, after all that talk, he's now talking to those that trust him. And it's quite like what we're going through today in the church. With all that's going on in this country, with all that's going on with, with, with these diseases, with all that's going on with the economy, with all the hatred and the bitterness and the separation in this country, with all that's going on, God is saying, trust me, stay with me, you're going to go through some things, but everything is going to be okay. Let's look what he says in verse number eight. Therefore, wait for me. That's the hardest thing to do, isn't it? Wait for God. He says, for the day, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up as a witness, from the day that I show you that I will keep my promise, indeed my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out of them my indignation, all my burning anger, for all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. He says, wait and see that sin and unrighteousness will be judged by me through fire, through my anger. I will be zealous in bringing forth judgment. They were to wait on the Lord for his salvation. Those were truly his would see that they would, uh, uh, that, that they would be a part of, 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 of watching God judge the nation and coming out of the other side. But they'd have to wait. They have to endure. And this is what the New Testament teaches the church. Endure, 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 endure. Stay the course, stay the course. Continue the good fight. Endure. But, but, but we're in a place and we're in a nation that doesn't want to go through anything. 
Soon as tough times happen, we want to bail out. As soon as something happens financially, we want the government to bail us out. Bail us out, bail us out, bail us out. We're looking for the American dream, the American dream, the American dream. We need to stop looking for the American dream. And we need to start looking toward Christ and the life after this. They will wait for God to act not only in judgment, but also to act on their behalf. He's talking to a remnant saying, wait and see, I will bring judgment. And this is a positive plea. It's an exhortation, and exhortation is an address or a, a communication that is emphatically urging somebody to do something. He says in this plea, watch and see what I do. There's a lot of people in the nation that remember what happened in the northern kingdom. They remember what happened to the ten tribes that got swallowed up by Assyria. They, 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 they see that even though the, the king here in the days of uh, Zephaniah has gone through a huge transformation, a huge restoration of the temple, a huge restoration of religion, the people's hearts are still wrong. They're going through the motions. But they're not any closer to God than they've ever been. They have one eye on God and one eye on everything that they have. And they can care less about God. Here, Josiah has changed the landscape. Everybody has to observe the feast days. And, and, and everybody has to, to go to temple. And everybody has to pray. How did that do for us in the 80s, in the early uh, uh, 80s and the late 70s when we had the blue law in Texas. Do you remember the blue law? There was a law in Texas that said you cannot buy stuff on Sunday unless it's food. That was to keep you out of the store shopping and keep you into church. I can remember... Uh, the, the old Baptist church we went to, we weren't allowed to play on Sundays. You go to church, and once you're done with church, you go to grandma's house, you eat, and you sit on the front porch. You can't mess around. They made sure you could, didn't mess around because you're still in your Sunday clothes, and you would get a good beating, beating if, if you messed up those Sunday clothes. That was the Lord's Day. People still got drunk. People still, still did things outside the blue law. It doesn't matter what you sanction people to do. If their hearts aren't right, it means absolutely nothing to God. And that's what was going on here. And Zephaniah is urging those who trust God to wait and see what he does. It's coming. 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. It's coming. And we need to do likewise in our time. Waiting on the Lord once again is the hardest thing to do. And this society that says you, you can have everything right now. You can have everything handed to you. If you really, really want it, go get it. And we don't want to wait on anything. been born in a time when our desires are matched with the speed in which those desires can be satisfied. Everything's at lightning speed. But God doesn't change. And this church has to wait on him. The true church. He will bring his will to fruition when he desires it to be to fruition. And it's not on our timetable. We ask the Lord, why is this person president? Why would this person get elected to be? That's God's timetable. <laughs> why are we going through such economic issues? You know what's a funny thing? 
is on the news, the big thing is if you don't order in the next couple of weeks, you'll never get your Christmas packages until after Christmas. If you don't order soon, you're going to miss your Christmas packages coming in. How crazy are we in this country? We're really freaking out over Christmas gifts coming in. Why are you shaking your head yes? You're not getting any. We already told you that. <laughs> yeah, you, oh, that's why you say, she said we don't have anything to worry about. <laughs> you're right. Um, <laughs> no, that's not. I mean, it's funny. Everything is now, 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 now. Do you remember when you were hungry, you had to go home and cook something to eat? Growing up, we didn't go out every day. It, it, it's amazing. How the timetable has changed. We can't wait for anything today. And God says, wait on me. And we're saying, I, I want a second opinion. I'll go somewhere else and they say I can have it now. If I digress, let me go back to verse number eight. There will be, there will be salvation for the remnant that trust God. Not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is going to be saved. It's a remnant. It's few. Not many, it's few. But they would have to be patient as God brings judgment down on the people. They'll have to wait patiently and go through some pain to come out the other end. Because this is according to God's will. Patience works great things in our heart. So as he's working on our heart with patience, he's working every iota of this time. Wait, God says, until I punish the wicked. Wait, God says, until, the judge, uh, until after the judgment when I gather the remnant from among his people. Wait, God says, and see. And at this point, he has not even punished the nation. They're experiencing wealth like they never had before. Sounds almost crazy to hear this prophet speak of gloom and doom when everybody's having the time of their life. You could say that they were living their best lives now. <laughs> but God must gather up all the people where they are and bring them to where he wants them to be. And this is the thrust of uh, verse number eight. This is what he's saying. So God tells the remnant to wait in hope and trust that God will do as he has spoken. Many of them died waiting on the Lord. You know the good news of those remnant, uh, of, of the remnant believers are? When they were waiting and died, they went to see him. <laughs> amen and amen. It was either going to be good or great. Great as if you didn't have to wait when he calls you home. Amen. So let's look at verse number nine, because I really want to lead up to what uh, um, what this is all about in verse nine and ten. For then I will give to the people purified lips that all of them may call on the name of the Lord. He's not talking about the ones he's going to judge. He's talking about the ones that he says to wait. The remnant. That all of them may call on the name of the Lord to serve him shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the river of Ethiopia. Now, that, now we're looking at a bigger picture. As Zephaniah is telling the people that God is going to judge the nation. He then says when he judges the nations, he will then look past Ethiopia. He's starting to talk about gathering a remnant from around the world. Beyond the river of Ethiopia, my worshipers, my dispersed ones, those that were in the diaspora will bring my offerings. They will come back from the places in which they were scattered. 
God will take the people who are with him, those who trusted him, through it all, and cleanse them. He will prepare them to sing God's praises. They will be called into service. They will be called to worship. Gathering them to make a nation of true believers in God. When was he going to do that? We know that after Nebuchadnezzar, after the 70, 70 years in which the Jews were, were in captivity, they all went back to Jerusalem. Not all. They went back to Jerusalem, those that wanted to go. So this particular point hasn't happened. Not in, not in the days after Nebuchadnezzar. When did this day happen? When did he begin to gather up individuals from the nations? When did he begin to cleanse their lips? Well, we know what a diaspora is. A diaspora is the scattering of people. And we've seen that before. When was the first diaspora? When is the first time God scattered people? Yeah, let's go, yeah, let's go down there. Let's go to Genesis chapter 11. That's pretty good. Genesis chapter 11, we see a strange thing. Beginning in verse number 1 of chapter 11 in Genesis, the whole earth was of one language. Do you see that? I'm going to be reading from the King James Version. Genesis 10, 1. I mean, 11, 1. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. They said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime or tar had they for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name. Let us make ourselves great again. No, let us make ourselves a name. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth, the whole earth. Let us make ourselves strong or we will be scattered throughout the earth. Now, why would they be afraid of that? Why would they be afraid to be scattered? What did God say to Noah when he got out of the ark? What did he say to Noah and the family? And then what did he say? He said to repopulate the whole earth. Okay? They got off the ark and they started populating there. God said, go for it. God said, multiply. They stayed there. And multiply. So the first thing God says is populate the earth. The next thing they do is disobey them and they stay together. And they said, let's stay together. Let's build a great city. Let's build a tower that reaches into heaven. That way we won't be scattered. They're all speaking the same language. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built or building. The Lord said, Behold, the people is one. They're unified and they have all one language. 
And this they uh, begin to do, and now nothing will be restraining or restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. They will continue to imagine vain things. It's a mob mentality, right? The strength in numbers, right? Verse 7, go to, let us go down, and there confound their language. Let us begin to confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. They left off to build the city. They forgot about building the city because they couldn't understand what anybody was saying. So they left to their own places. They then went or they were scattered by God at this point. God said, go populate the world. They said, no, we're going to hang out here. And then he, he confused their language and then they scattered upon all the face of the earth. Some went to Russia, some went to Ethiopia, some went, yeah, they just scattered. Okay? The first diaspora, the first scattering. Okay? Now, many people allude to chapter 3 of Zephaniah, verse 9. And then I will give to the people purified lips. Purified lips might be alluding to making the languages the same once again. Okay? Making the languages the same the same once again. He scattered the people from around the world that they may not come together to try to be as God is in the Tower of Babel. God gathers the heathen and the sinner together for judgment and then gathers the believer after he judges the sinner. He then will gather the believer and he will make them able to worship. Able to sing the same song. When have we heard the confusion of different languages subsiding? Has that happened yet? Has that happened? Many scholars believe it has. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Many people believe this is actually, although Peter quotes from Joel, this is also part of coming together that Zephaniah is talking about. He's going to call people from all different, lang all different uh, nations and tongues coming together. Right? Well, let's see. Acts chapter 2. Everybody there? Yeah. I'll be reading from the King James. Follow along with whatever you have in front of you. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, Pentecost, you know they were celebrating Pentecost years before the day of Pentecost? in anticipation of Pentecost. The Feast of Pentecost was 50 days after the Feast of Passover. Penta means 50. 50 days after 
Passover. Okay? When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. These are these individuals in the upper room, right? You guys remember that? How many people in the upper room? Verse number 15 of chapter 1. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of the name together were about 120, okay? So in this room, there was about 120 people, okay? And they were all on one accord in one place. And what were they doing? They were praying. And why were they in the upper room? They were told to go up there and wait. Okay? Let's look at uh, verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it fit as a, like a, okay? Rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. It wasn't fire, it was like fire. You know what fire looks like, right? It looked like that. And it sat upon each of them. It covered the room and everybody in the room. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. This is the first time an indwelling of the Holy Ghost takes place that in, in which he stays with them. He doesn't leave them. Okay? This is what Jesus promised. And began to speak other languages. Okay? As the Spirit, as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance, as the Holy Spirit commanded them to, as the Holy Spirit gifted them to. All right? So they're sitting in the upper room. They begin to speak other languages. Other languages aren't heavenly languages. Uh, they're from Galilee. And instead of speaking Greek, uh, they were speaking Russian. They were speaking Chinese. And they were speaking all other kind of languages. It wasn't like the Tower of Babel where it was confusing. It was the opposite. It was God spreading the people out. Here it's God bringing the people together. Now why would God have them speak different languages at this time? But they weren't all speaking the same language. Why would he allow them to do that? They all understood each other before this. Why? In the Hebrew tradition, there was a certain number of feasts you had to attend as a Jew. Everybody went to Jerusalem for Passover. Okay? 50 days later, it wasn't like you just hop on a plane and go out and say, I'll come back a couple months later and I'll go back. No. When you take a big trip, when you take a big journey, you would travel all this way and you would stay there for two feasts and then you're off the hook. You've served your, your, your tradition. Okay. So they were all there. They were still there during this time. Because they were all there for Passover. Now they're all there for the Feast of Pentecost. All the Jews that were scattered all came back because that was a tradition. So, verse number five. There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. They all came because it was a requirement. So Jews that came from all other nations, we know later on there was people from Ethiopia. Isn't it funny? 
that he says, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers. That, that's what Ze Zephaniah just said in, in verse 10. The people from, from Ethiopia, and we're going to see that, some of that in a second. So here, all these Jews are coming from all over, right? Verse number six. Now, when this was noised abroad, when people heard this was going on, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own tongue or his own language. Here, the Russian Jews are sitting there and they're saying, that guy over there is speaking Russian. That's odd. They didn't have Google Translate back then. So the Italian Jews are saying, oh my God, no, they're saying, they're speaking Italian, right? So they begin to gather around these people coming out of the upper room speaking their language, and it's odd because these people are local. This is before Rosetta Stone, right? Were you gonna, did you raise your hand? Yeah. Oh. No, 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 no. The Russian Jews gathered together in a group and they all went over to Jerusalem to go through the Passover and go to Pentecost. And then they were going to go back. That's it. While they were there, here comes these people that are speaking their language and they're saying, why is he speaking my language? They're from here. They're not with us. They're not with our group. How, how, how can we hear them? So as the, the people coming out of the upper room, some of them spoke Russian, some of them spoke Italian, some of them spoke Chinese, and, and so the Chinese people, Jews were gathering around the people speaking Chinese. It was, it was it, they were confounded by that. Does that make sense? It's like if each and every one of us began to speak a different language and there was a big convention in El Paso from people all over the world and we were sitting at the, or we were at the convention beginning to speak and we were beginning to talk about Christ and people started gathering saying, when did you learn Russian? Are you from here? That's weird. So let's go on. They were confounded, they were confused because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Every man, every, every person from outside the city that was visiting. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these speak, uh, which speak Galileans? Wait a minute, they're not Italian or they're not Russian. Why are they speaking our language? How can they speak our language? And how hear we, every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? How are we able to do this? And then it goes on to where they were from. The Parthians, the, Med uh, the Medes, the Elamites, and, and all these individuals, right? So that they're, they're strangers from all over the lands, and they've come from Rome, from from Cyrene, they come from Egypt, they come from all over. They're Jewish individuals there to go through the, the feasts and then they hear their language and they are amazed that these people are speaking different languages of their native tongues, right? Verse 11, the Cretes were there, the Arabians were there. We do hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Now they're speaking the gospel. <laughs> and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? What is going on here? This is very strange. But they're listening to the message. And the message is the gospel in their language. Now, there's always a flip side, right? There's always a, a flip side. Others mocking said, verse 13, others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. They are drunk as a skunk, right? 
But Peter, standing up with the 11, here's the greatest message outside of Jesus Christ ever preached. Peter, standing up with the 11, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeking or seeing, it is but the third hour of the day. What is the third hour of the day? 9 a.m. 9 a.m. So they can't be drunk. It's 9 a.m. In this culture, they can be drunk, but back then it was 9 a.m. <laughs> For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is what uh, that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. By the way, we're going to go to Joel after we go through Zephaniah. <laughs> and what does Joel say? He begins to recite scripture. He begins to tell. Now, now remember, Peter just denied Christ. Okay? Remember, Peter's a fisherman. But he's quoting scripture. He doesn't make it up on the fly. He gives them scripture and then he explains scripture. <laughs> That's how we should preach, right? And it shall come to pass in the last days, in the last days, these are the days in which Zephaniah was talking about. Are we in the last days today? Of course we are. Just because it hasn't happened today doesn't mean we're not in the last days. This, it, this has started the last days is what Peter is saying. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see dreams and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days, in the last days of my spirit and they shall prophesy and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs above. On earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whomsoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He said, this is the scripture. This is what thus saith the Lord through the prophet Joel. Now let me expound on it and let me preach about it. Verse 22, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and signs, of, uh, miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, and ye yourselves also know. This Jesus Christ, he says, him being delivered by the, the, the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. He starts with the bad news. <laughs> Ooh, y'all in trouble. Amen? He gives them scripture. He tells the situation of what they're in right now. These are all the Jews now that have come in for Passover and stayed for Pentecost. They all have his ear because God has just sent them a sign and wonder which drew them to the preaching through the different languages, the foreign languages they began to speak. God got their attention. Now he's going to give them the word. You have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain Jesus Christ, he's saying. Whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. God, you killed him, but God raised him. You're in trouble. You're in trouble. You killed him, but he didn't stay dead. Uh-oh. Verse number five, uh, 25. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope 
because thou wilt not leave my soul in shale, in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to be to see corruption. Meaning, you will not only uh, 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 get me out of hell or keep me from hell, but you won't even let your son's body begin to decompose. Three days. <laughs> see, David says, you're not going to keep my body in shale, meaning he's under, he's been buried a long time. He said, but your son won't even see corruption of his body three days. <laughs> thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy continence. Then he jumps to verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. David is still dead. Jesus lives. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, of the fruit of David's loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. See, everybody loves King David. But you're in love with the wrong man. <laughs> you should have been in love with the one you just killed. Verse number 31. He seen this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus has God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. He says, that's the bad news. You're in trouble. Therefore, being on the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promises of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which you now see, and here, and because of God bringing forth the Holy Spirit, you are seeing people speaking in different languages to tell you and to get your attention that Jesus lives. David has not ascended into the heavens, but he said himself. This always boggles my mind. I read this over and over and over again, and it boggles my mind. Look what David said. The Lord said unto my Lord. <laughs> God the Father said to God the Son. He said that all the way back in Psalm. The Lord said to my Lord. Do you see the, do you see God the Father, God the Son, and Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Here's another therefore. Therefore let all the house of Israel be uh, know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you have crucified. You see, that's the bad news. You killed the precious jewel of heaven. <laughs> you killed him. whom you have crucified both Lord and, and Christ. You killed him. You, you, you trampled on him. You, you, you killed him for the wrong motives, but God raised him up because he is the son of God. What did they do when they heard the bad news? 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? How do we fix it? You can't tell people about Jesus Christ until they realize they need a Savior. <laughs> All these churches want to keep giving people good news, good news, good news. Don't talk about sin. It makes people feel bad. Well, without the bad news, there's no good news. What can we do? How do we fix it? Are we doomed to hell? Is it over for us? Woe is us. How do we fix this? Here's the great news. And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the one you crucified, in the name of Jesus. Surrender unto him 
for the remissions of your sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. It is God that will call those that will be in the family. He continued to preach, but we don't see any more of this. Luke cuts it here in verse 40. He says, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received the word <laughs> were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Here, God confounds them in the Tower of Babel. Here on Pentecost, in the last days, God brings the church into existence. And through the church, he brings all the languages into unity at this point. Is this what Zephaniah is speaking of in verse 9 and 10 in chapter 3? I believe so. I believe this is what he was talking about. From beyond the river Ethiopia. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. Here, beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, turn to Acts chapter 8. People are starting to go back home now. Okay? On their journeys back to Russia and, and Italy and Japan and China. And not the United States. I know you guys are waiting for the United States, but you know, that's a whole different thing going on there. It's not happening. I know what Joseph Smith said. He was up there in Utah and first yeah. he was in Minnesota and then in something like that. No. Look at verse number 26 of Acts chapter 8. The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south of, uh, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Philip is doing a great work. And God says, Stop doing that and go over there. Go to the middle of the desert. Verse 27. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers. Zephaniah says in verse 10. Let's look at this here. A man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all of her treasure and had come to Jerusalem to worship. Why did he come to Jerusalem to worship? Because he was proselyte. He was a, 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 a Gentile that turned Jewish. And was worshiping, serving, because it was Passover and Pentecost. He was returning to Ethiopia and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join yourself to this chariot. Go join this caravan that is going back. Now understand, it's a huge caravan. Covered wagons pulling this all this back to Ethiopia. How do we know it's a huge caravan? Because this man is, was of great authority. They weren't going to let him travel by himself. There's a couple of things that we notice here. The man that was sitting, the Ethiopian eunuch, was an educated man. He could read. And he was reading Isaiah. Nobody had scripture except rich people. The Spirit says, go and join yourself to that caravan. Look at Philip. How's this for evangelism? He ran to him. <laughs> and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said 
understand that uh, thou what thou readest. Do you understand what you're reading? He's, he, he, he's next to the caravan or next to the cart, and, and, he's, and the guy's reading uh, uh, Isaiah, and he says, do you understand what you're reading? Now, if he didn't run at that time, he would have missed that whole passage of Scripture that he was reading. But he got there right in time, and it, right when he got there, it was the point that spoke of Jesus Christ. And he said, how can I, except some man should guide me? How can I understand what I'm reading unless somebody tell me what I'm reading? And he desired, he asked Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture where he read was this. He was led as sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shear, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And whom shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? <laughs> the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The eunuch answered Philip. It, now, now understand, Philip isn't an apostle. What is Philip? You guys know what Philip is? He's a disciple, but he... He's a deacon. Now, how in the world does he know this? How can he exposit this passage? The Ethiopian eunuch, or the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? And Philip opened up his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Gospel. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? He, he went so through the gospel that he was able to get through baptism. To the point where when they finally came to water, the eunuch said, how come I can't be baptized? There goes some water right here. Philip said, verse 37, if thou believest with all your heart, there you go. You may be baptized. If you believe, not you got to pray this prayer. If you believe, you got to go to church. You got to give 10%. If you believe, not kind of believe, right? Not sort of believe. What does he say? If you believe with your whole heart, with all your heart, You may. And what does he do? He confesses that he believes. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. <laughs> and he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Philip baptizes a eunuch. Look what happens. Verse number 39, and this is where we're going to close. And when they were come up out of the water, after he baptized them, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. Philip disappears. Why is that crucial? Because the eunuch will be glorifying Philip. God says, you're done. It's time for you to go. And the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Where was he going? He went all the way back to Ethiopia. Carrying what? The word of God, the gospel, and salvation along with him. <laughs> Isn't that tremendous? That's how God works. He says, I'm going to spread them out past Ethiopia. 
Thank goodness past Ethiopia, beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, hits on our shores too. Amen. Praise God. And you know what's funny? It's the same message and it's just as powerful than the days that it was given on the day of Pentecost to save our lives today. It's not watered down over the generations. It's not watered down over land. It's not watered down over sea. The same gospel that saved their souls is the same gospel that saves ours. Without fail. And Zephaniah says in chapter 3 that God told them, Zephaniah says that God told them, for then I will give the people's purified lips that all of them may call on the name of the Lord to serve him shoulder to shoulder from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. My worshipers, my dispersed ones, will bring my offering. When were they dispersed? They were dispersed at the time of the Babel. Time of the Babylons. And he's bringing us all together with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Zephaniah says, wait and see. Wait and see what God is going to do. Now we're looking back centuries to the days of Zephaniah. And those people, when he was speaking to them, were imagining these days today. Do you think they would think it was worth it? They were going through some troubled times. As we sit in this church, if any of them were here, do you think he would say it was worth the pain and suffering? Look at these individuals that have come to Christ. God is faithful. And we're worried about stimulus checks. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how petty we become? And how great God is? We need to get back to this heart. We need to get back to the truth. We need to get back to the days in which he called us out of darkness. We need to get back to the day in which we were saved. And we need to cherish that God keeps his word. And if you don't understand how far, how far back it goes, it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. That's when the promise starts. That's when it says. That I'll put enmity between your seed and the seed of the woman. That's Christ will fix it. And he has in our life. We are blessed people. People in Zephaniah's day that were suffering. They were thinking about these days here. They were wondering what it was going to look like. God is still saving lives, brothers and sisters. You know what the crazy thing is? He'll use you and I to work the process. <laughs> just like he did Philip. Just like he did Peter. He will use us to help the process. And he encourages us to step out on a limb and give the word, the good news. Any questions or comments before we close in prayer? One announcement, we will be here when to start working on those baskets. Are you sure? Tomorrow at four? All hands on deck if you can get here. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Almighty God, for this hour that you have given us. And we thank you, Lord, that we can see you working throughout the centuries, throughout the different people of the world, and in our life. 
Pastor, when we begin to look at you through your word, you become bigger, which makes us a lot smaller. No better place we should be than smaller in the realm and the grand scheme of things. Continue to be a big God in our life. Continue to show us how big you are. We can continue to see where we fit in the equation. Bless the brothers and sisters that were able to come out tonight, Almighty God. May we give them safe travels back to their homes. May this stir in their hearts and in their minds as they rest their heads on their pillows. That we are one step closer to better understanding you. May it may be applied in our life. Pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great night. Get some rest. It's almost 8.30. Thank you, my brother.